Tonight we have an extra edition of questions and answers. Uh, some of the ones we get we may answer three or four at a time, but uh, some others require a little longer uh, scrutiny, and that's uh, certainly the case with this one, because the question is, what's the modern day Church of Satan all about? Do they believe in Jesus and baptism? Uh, well, there are probably a thousand ways to answer this question. Uh, and uh, we're just going to take one approach. There is a tremendous amount of material available. And we can only cover a very tiny portion of the more than 500 pages that I read uh, just to refresh my memory on this subject. So we would like to begin, and by the way, when somebody says one church is as good as another, you might call this one to their attention and see if they still want to hold that view. So what is this all about? The Church of Satan was established on April 30th, 1966 in San Francisco by Anton Zandor LaVey who was the church's high priest until his death in 1997. LeVay is the one who wrote the Satanic Bible and uh, published that three years later in 1969. It consists of four parts. Part one is the book of Satan. It contradicts the Ten Commandments and the golden rule, which should provide you a clue as to how they feel about Jesus or any kind of obedience to him. In part two, the book of Lucifer, uh, we have uh, a primarily philosophical section dealing with love, hate, sex, and indulgence. Part three, is the book of Belial, and it details magic and various rituals, which they call sex, compassion, and destruction. The one pertaining to sex is called the love charm, and it is uh, when issued supposed to create a desire in the person uh, of one's object who is giving the uh, charm, it's supposed to create a desire for that person. And so it's a love charm. Uh, the second one is to bring evil on others. And uh, so the ritual of uh, compassion, the third one, is to wish for other people to have success. I call these three rituals uh, that pertain to sex a hex and success. Uh, that seems to be the way that it is. By the way, uh, Jeff uh, found this in the Washington Post as recently as July 30th, 2016. An after-school satanic club could be coming to your child's elementary school. Well, just so you don't run out of things to worry about, uh, as Paul Harvey used to say. Number four... The book of Leviathan provides four invocations for Satan, lust, compassion, and destruction. It also lists the 19th Enochian keys, which we're not even going to have time to uh, discuss. All in all, the Satanic Bible contains 272 pages. In 1972... Since uh, LaVey was having so much success, he published another book called The Satanic Rituals. Uh, but we're not going to go into that one either. There's simply not enough time. What we are going to look at are the nine satanic statements. And so let's begin with them. Number one, and by the way, you can look these up. A, a lot of the material I read and studied, you probably cannot verify, but this, you can. You can go uh, to the internet and find this for yourself. 
Number one, Satan represents indulgence instead of abstinence. Well, uh, all I can say about this precept is that's absolutely true. Uh, Satan does represent indulgence. Compare Galatians 5, 19 through 21, which we just looked at, with Galatians uh, 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, what are the items listed in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, if not indulgence? Isn't that what they're dealing with? Uh, let's take a little bit of a closer look. <clears throat> Galatians 5, let's read verse 21 first, the third of the three verses. Uh, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Uh, these are some of the works of the flesh. And that reminds us of going back to Proverbs chapter 23 and noticing verses 29 through 35. Uh, let's take a look at that section of Proverbs. Proverbs 23, beginning with verse 29. This is a familiar passage. You probably recall it. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly, at the last it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things, and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like a one who lies down in the midst of the sea, or like the one who lies at the top of the mast, saying, They have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? Well, uh, that's giving in, isn't it? That's indulgence, isn't it? And, of course, that's what Satanism goes along with. Now, uh, there are some other things in Galatians 5 and verse 19. Notice this verse. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness and lewdness you might paraphrase parts of the passage we just read concerning wine and say who has stds and unplanned parent uh, pregnancies and multiple abortions yes it would be those who have no self-control wouldn't it be uh, verse 20 of uh, Galatians 5 contains character defects such as hatred, contentions, wrath, heresies, all of which are the opposites of uh, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. He who controls his spirit is better than the mighty. He that rules himself than he who takes a city. But Satanism is not about ruling oneself. Satanism is about indulging oneself. And so you're going to have all of these uh, displays of a bad character along with the lusts of the flesh, along with drunkenness, drugs, and so forth. So truly, Satanists are encouraged to become selfish louts. Let's go to number two. Satan represents vital existence instead of spiritual pipe dreams. Yeah, in prison. If you indulge yourself the way that they uh, would like for you to, many times you're going to be accused of crimes and locked up because many of those things are immoral and illegal. Christianity invites people to live life to the fullest, to develop talents, and enjoy this life while living righteously before God. We have a joyous life now and an even better one later. These are not pipe dreams. This is a way to live. Remember, we talked 
about the way not too long ago. And that is the way of joy and peace and prosperity. The way of indulgence is not. And we might ask them ourselves as we're reading through some of these, what is the evidence for the assertions that are made in these uh, satanic principles? Uh, let's go to number three. Satan represents undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical self-deceit. Well, that, that's a nice way to characterize things, isn't it? I guess if you're providing the definitions, you can make the definition what you want it to be. But let's take an incident from the Old Testament where Elijah faced 450 false uh, prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18. Baal, by the way, is one of the names that Satanists like to use, so apparently they shouldn't have any problem with us referring to this. But who was wise calling on a false deity? And who was self-deceived? Not Elijah. Baal's prophets received no answer, though they called on him from morning to noon and noon till evening, and there was no response. But Jehovah's prophet, Elijah, had his sacrifice accepted. By the way, the prophets of Baal were put to death on that occasion. But let's go to number four. Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on ingrates. Well, that's interesting. Actually, Satan is never kind to anyone. He uses people. Did he care about Judas? When Judas had the thought of committing suicide, did Satan go, Hey, friend, uh, you might be of a lot more use if you stay around. Don't kill yourself. I don't find Satan doing that. Once he uses people and gets them to accomplish his purpose, he's through with them. He has no kindness toward them. He has no care for them. He just uses it. But what about love wasted on ingrates? Well, let's take a look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. Yes, it's easy uh, to make a statement like this. And uh, it does appear to be true in many cases, doesn't it? But in Acts chapter 2 and verse 36... Peter says, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Would you call these people ingrates because they had rejected Christ and his teachings and his miracles and called out for his death on the cross? I think that might be a fair assessment, but sometimes ingrates come around. And we read in uh, verse 38 that when Peter told them to repent and be baptized, about 3,000 were, and, uh, and, uh, were baptized, and they were added unto the church, Acts 2 and verse 41. So... Do we really want to get rid of ingrates? Do we really want to treat them hostily? Is that going to make them any better? Or should we be patient and allow them an opportunity to change the attitudes that they have had? But even if they don't change, for example, in Luke 17, 11 through 19, Jesus healed 10 lepers and only one returned to thank him. I guess that makes the other nine ungrateful, which it certainly seems to be. But haven't we heard of the concept of doing what is right because it is right, regardless of how people respond? There are always going to be people who don't respond to love. There are always going to be people who don't respond 
to the gospel and uh, to the invitation that is given. But you give them the opportunity. Let that decision be theirs. Don't say, oh, you ingrate, I'm not going to have anything to do with you. Give them an opportunity to change their minds. Satanism says, in effect, I don't care about you. I gave you a chance, you blew it. I don't care about you, you're done. That's the idea of Satanism. That's not the idea of Christianity. Let's go on to number five. Satan represents vengeance instead of turning the other cheek. One question, with this philosophy, would there ever have been an Apostle Paul? If we write people off immediately because they're ungrateful, because they don't accept the truth, would there ever have been an Apostle Paul in all of the beautiful and practical letters that he wrote that are part of the New Testament? There is a time for vengeance, but neither Satan nor human beings know when that time is. God is the only one who knows, and that's why his justice is perfect, even if some of it waits till the day of judgment. Number six, Satan represents responsibility to the responsible instead of concern for psychic vampires. I got to admit, I love this phraseology, <laughs> even though the point is all wrong. Uh, it's very cleverly worded. But this is basically just another example of I don't care about you. That's all that it is. We just simply ignore, write off, and get rid of people that we don't think ha have any uh, chance of success by our terms of definition. Number seven. Man is just another animal, sometimes better, more often worse. Man has, because of his divine spiritual and intellectual development, become the most vicious animal of all. Proof. Where is proof for any of the statements that are made in these satanic principles? Yes, man can be far more vicious than animals because we have the ability to think and not just act through instinct. But let's ask the question, how many have been killed in the name of religion? We seem to be accused of being vicious. How many have been killed in the name of religion? Well, okay, the Spanish Inquisition, a lot of estimates say around 30,000. But some have estimated it to be as high as half a million. That's probably a bit much, but we'll go with the larger uh, figure. During the witchcraft, uh, well, there's a lot of words you could call it, debacle, uh, just all kinds of uh, hysteria going on. During that time, it's estimated that in Europe, there were, uh, and other places, there were about five million people put to death. And then there's the Crusades. It's estimated that one million people were put to death. So, even using the very highest figures that are available, we have a uh, half million, five million, and a million. That's six and a half million people put to death for religious causes. Now, remember that neither Jesus nor the Christian system authorized any of this. Jesus and his apostles did not train people to go into battle and fight. Uh, that's, that's not the purpose. Uh, they, they were never taught to put away heretics. You want to defeat them through sound logic but they, we've never been commanded to put a heretic to death. We've never been commanded to participate in crusades against another religion. 
physical battles. And uh, even though there was a commandment in the Old Testament, since Israel was also uh, a government as well as God's people, they were to put witches to death, but there is no such commandment in the New Testament. So none of these are authorized. By the way, talk about inconsistency. On the one hand, LaVey chides people for turning the other cheek and then implies Christians are vicious. Well, which is it? You can't have it both ways. Pick a side and stick with it. Now, the Nazis, in a matter of about 10 years or so, killed 6 million people all by themselves, not in the name of Christ. Actually, Hitler was into Oriental religion uh, from India and so on. Uh, so there was nothing Christian about anything that he did, and in fact, he opposed Christians and uh, even put to death some uh, because they showed that what he was doing was against the scriptures. All right, so maybe a godless society would do better, huh? Uh, you got these six and a half million people killed as a result of Christianity, although not legitimately Christian, as we pointed out. So what would we get with a godless society? Well, that must be a lot better, right? Under Joseph Stalin, 20 million people died, and that's a low estimate. 20 million people, that's almost three times all of those who in a matter of centuries were put to death, and he did it in a matter of years. But let's not stop there, let's go to Mao. It's estimated that he killed between 40 and 80 million people. Christianity couldn't even compare to that if they'd have been killing people from the first century. But of course, we're not commanded to kill people. So, godless doesn't seem to go very well. Satanism doesn't seem to go very well. And so that's not the answer to mankind's problems. Now, those under the influence of Satan or no God at all have nothing about which to brag. They, they can't boast that they are better in any way you want to compare them. Number eight, the so-called sins, LeVay writes, all lead to physical, mental, or emotional gratification. The fact is that Sin makes people emotionally stunted, full of guilt, with psychiatric problems and physical problems, as mentioned before. Why are psychologists in business? The healthiest people, mentally and emotionally, are Christians. And then number nine, Satan has been the best friend the church has ever had as he has kept it in business all these years. Well... If Satan believed that, he'd quit his job. He doesn't believe that. Uh, we only have to sin one time in order to be lost. No, he keeps tempting people to sin to make them miserable. He is relentless in his uh, design to make people sin. He doesn't want people to be happy. He wants them to be as miserable as he is. Now, there is one good Fairly good quote from LeVay. <clears throat> he said, We feel a person should be free to indulge in all the so-called fetishes that they would desire as long as they don't hurt anyone that doesn't deserve or wish to be hurt. You see how he left the door open there? Oh, well, they deserved it. Yeah, that's how you can justify it to yourself. But uh, the rest of the statement is uh, actually not bad for a Satanist. But not all Satanists feel that way. Alistair Crowley was the forerunner of LaVey. He was born in England in 1875. As a child, he was so evil that his mother nicknamed him the Beast. That was not a term of endearment. 
It was a name which he liked for himself. And he didn't bother with nine principles like LaVey would uh, later on enumerate. In his Law of Thelema, he says, This book lays down a simple code of conduct. There is no law beyond do what thou wilt. I find it interesting that in 1875 he was using 1611 King James English when he said that. Uh, you would have thought he would have used more modern terminology. But nevertheless, that's what he said. And then he went on to say that the... Uh, Yeah, do what you will. Then he goes on to say, do what you will, but that's a contrast to what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, do what God wills. Now, who has the most wisdom? God the creator or man the created being? Well, uh, apparently Crowley thought he had much more wisdom. Uh, what God commands us for our good, uh, Crowley says will lead to ruin. By the way, he had a corollary to do what thou wilt, and that was uh, <clears throat> good is evil and evil is good. You know, now, Isaiah wrote nearly 2,500 years before Crowley that there would be some who would come and say that. And uh, evil is good, good evil, bitter is sweet, sweet is bitter. And that's exactly what Crowley did. And he did not, unlike LaVey, mind harming others even a little bit. He wrote a book uh, called Magic in which he suggested that the best human sacrifice was a child, a male child, perfect in innocence, and of high intelligence, concerning which he wrote that he who undergoes the most blessed and merciful of all deaths. It is estimated that he was responsible for the alleged sacrifice of 150 human beings between 1912 and 1928. LaVey, in his Satanic Bible, said, Under no circumstances would a Satanist sacrifice any animal or baby. And yet we know that animals are sacrificed uh, repeatedly in Satanistic groups. No wonder Crowley came to be called the wickedest man on earth. And he was kicked out of Italy for allegedly practicing infant sacrifice, though he was not officially charged. And one of his disciples there died from drinking blood, which is a characteristic of a lot of Satanistic groups. Now, the scriptures prohibit this practice because the life is in the blood, Leviticus 17, 10 and 11. But it is precisely for that reason that Satanists drink from it, to get the energy and the life from what it is that they are consuming. Well, after the bizarre ritual death of his grown son, Crowley allegedly spent his last years in senility. He became a heroin addict and died in poverty about 75 years ago. And this is the person who once wrote in his book, Magic, one would go mad if he took the Bible seriously, but to take it seriously, one must already be mad. All the Christians that I know and have known over the number of years at the time of their deaths were sane. Crowley, however, appears not to have been coherent. Now, we might ask the question, why are people drawn to Satanism? Bob Larson wrote, The lure of Satanism is selfishness, the same gratifying impulse that causes many 
to turn to drugs. And if you doubt that, remember Crowley's creed, do what thou wilt, what is that but extreme selfishness. People like the message of the law, do what thou wilt. Paul said that many Christians would turn away from the truth for the same reason. Uh, let's, let's take a look at that from uh, 2 Timothy 4, uh, verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they want people to tell them what they want to hear, they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned unto fables. So the same thing can happen to Christians as what is described here in Satanism. There's another passage that deals with that, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 12 through 19. Let's take a quick look. 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 12. But these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and they cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children." They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey, speaking with a man's voice, restrained the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. For when they speak, great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption, or by whom a person is overcome by him who is brought into bondage. Although these are words that are describing Christians who have gone back into the world. They could be every bit describing Satanists because the, the pattern is the same. It is clear that the appeal is the same for these Christians who uh, apparently did not really want to be Christians to start with. And those who are Satanists, you can do what you want. That's the appeal. Satanists promise freedom, but they get enslavement. Only the truth can set people free. John 8, 31 and 32. This is where I pray I am standing when Jesus returns. And I pray that you are standing with the truth also. Where will you be at the time that Jesus comes back? Have you looked into the truth? This is where we find out about the nature of God, the nature of ourselves, and the nature of Satan. This is where the true answers lie. If you have never obeyed the gospel, we invite you to do so this evening, repenting of your sins, being baptized like those on Pentecost were that we looked at earlier. If you've already done that but have not been living faithfully, you don't want to go astray because Satan will lure you into doing all of those things we talked about in 2 Peter chapter 2. Can we help you this evening? Don't wait. Do something now while we stand and while we sing.